Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session of the Horizon Cloud Summit 2021. I am Giovanni Rimassa, uh, Chief Innovation Officer at Martel, and I will moderate this panel that will deal with uh, cloud standardization and open source for a robust digital cloud landscape. And um, you can, uh, I don't know if you have uh, followed already our previous sessions, but you might, if so, you might have noticed already that uh, some of the topics that we will go into deal with in this uh, in this session have been already uh, outlined and considered re very relevant in the opening session and in the high level panel that we had this morning the structure of this session is uh, an open uh, uh, panel discussion and i will shortly introduce uh, the five expert panelists that you can already see in the slide and uh, they will then start with uh, their own uh, let's say uh, initial statement on the on the topic so if i can now start uh, we have alessandra perilli senior director of automation and strategy at red hat we have antonio kung uh, chief uh, Executive Officer Trialog, Rob Digbon, Product Manager at Canonical, Jesus Luna, a Cloud Security and Certification Expert at Bosch, and then we have Leire Orue Cevaria, Project Director in the ICT Division of Technalia, and also here as representative of the Piacere Project. So welcome everyone to the speakers and, and the attendees. And um, as I quickly mentioned before, uh, we had already some... Um, some hints, both in the initial opening talks uh, from the European Commission and, and uh, invited keynote speakers, and also in the high level panel that uh, open source and standardizations are two very um, relevant tools and, and, uh, and opportunities to uh, push forward the the agenda of uh, cloud computing in Europe. So before we start with the discussion panel, I would like to go uh, around the table, so to speak, uh, to give you all uh, three to five minutes to introduce yourself and uh, let's say set the scene with your specific angle on the, on the topic of this, uh, of this session. So I would start with Alessandro, so floor is yours, no, please. Giovanni, thanks for having me today. Good morning, everybody, to the other panelists and to the audience. Um, I'm based in London. I am part of the Ansible Business Unit in Red Hat, and I lead the product development uh, and product strategy um, for the products that we have in our portfolio. My angle is automation, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, but I will try to be as broad as possible, not just restricted to those, to those um, specific areas. Very good. Then uh, Antonio. Hello, everyone. Antonio Kang. I'm located in Paris. I'm the CEO of Trilog. Trilog is a innovation company uh, working on the integration of innovation. And today we just have so many ICT innovations. Uh, they are not just small innovations. They are architecture innovation. It is complicated. The cloud is involved. So Giovanni, do you want me to say a little bit more or just uh, we just present shortly ourselves? So you, you can, if you have some, uh, let's say, okay. general statement yes. to frame your so, position is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my general statement is that uh, it's a major integration issue and we try to view some, to have different perspective of it. Okay, so I'll give you an example, the AI vi uh, vision of everything. And this is leading lots of uh, work, okay. Uh, the digital twin uh, vision, it is also leading this, okay? Uh, and also maybe uh, tra uh, transversal issues such as security, privacy, trustworthiness, okay? And uh, uh, we believe that uh, uh, there, there is an architecture impact which we have to standardize, but the architecture is implemented by complex ecosystems, so interoperability is at stake. So that's my point. Thank you very much, Antonio. Next, Rob, then. Hey, I'm Rob. Rob, uh, I'm based in, uh, well, just north of Brussels. Um, I'm a product manager for Canonical. Um, so Canonical is the publisher of Ubuntu, which is an open source uh, operating system. Uh, it's the most popular operating system on uh, the public clouds. Uh, that's both in the, the West and also uh, in Asia. Um, we, uh, we also uh, provide a a large range of um, 
infrastructure enablement solutions for private cloud. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I'm focused in, in Canonical on um, ML ops infrastructure for machine learning and artificial intelligence, and also on our data platform solutions. Thank you, Rob. Then Jesus, floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Giovanni. Uh, my name is Jesus Luna. I work in the security governance department of Robert Bosch EMBH based in Germany. Uh, my particular role is associated with the security governance of cloud computing, uh, both the private clouds from Bosch and also the public clouds from Bosch, with very particular focus on the topics of certification and also related to this interesting topic of certification and standardization. Also, I am playing today the role of a technical manager for the European project Medina, which is based or focusing on the topic of cybersecurity certification for the cloud, and in particular for empowering or enabling this new European cloud security certification scheme that uh, is being created by ENISA. Thank you, Jesus. Leire, your turn. So, hello, good morning, thank you for the invitation, uh, Giovanni. So, my name is Leire Rue Echevarria, and I'm working at Tecnalia, which is a, a research center in the north of Spain, in Basque Country. We are the largest uh, research center in Spain. Um, I am in Spain. Um, I am here uh, in my role as a project director of Cloud Continuum uh, Technologies. Uh, we, my main focus is research projects, and I'm working currently in two projects uh, related to the Cloud Continuum and also in um, related to standardization or certification. Uh, one is uh, Medina, already mentioned by Jesus, uh, focused on the continuous compliance of uh, cloud services uh, based on, or yeah, uh, with respect to the European certification scheme on cloud services that INISA is developing. And secondly, also as participant or coordinator of the PHR project, which is focused on SecOps, DevSecOps for infrastructure as code for heterogeneous infrastructures. And I'm also part of the ad hoc uh, working group of uh, ENISA. Uh, working in the cloud services certification scheme that now is going to be promoted as a SEN, uh, SENELEC standard. So I have multiple hats today. <laughs> That's always good. Thank you very much, Leire. And so before uh, starting with the, with the panel discussion, I just want to uh, nod to the, to the attendees uh, and also, again, uh, reiterate that this is also an open discussion, which means that you that are following through the Swapcar platform have a chat uh, um, stream where you can uh, comment, ask questions to specific panelists or, or more in general. And we are monitoring this and uh, I will then um, forward and pose your your, your comments and questions to the to the speakers. So let's say uh, the this session has two related but distinct topics, which is open source and standardization of the cloud. And uh, it is, uh, I think, comes to nobody's surprise that these two uh, are always. Um, considered together, even if they are not the same. And sometimes uh, they are. Uh, they don't even have to be always aligned in the same in the same direction. So my first question for you all would be how you see in the let's say with an eye to the near future of cloud computing in Europe, how do you see the relationship between open source and its various technical community and even normative levels and and standardization where you see synergies, where you see friction and how can we best they leverage both together. And uh, maybe let's go uh, reverse uh, order. So let's say let's start with Leire and then we go back. Okay, so I think that open source is um, it's a great way for innovation. Um, so I think open source should be promoted at least in the field of, uh, since we are here in the H cloud community and the European research community, I would say um, that it should be promoted in all kinds of research projects, unless uh, some uh, kind of um, 
intellectual property plays, plays a role, but in principle, um, all the results should be developed or should be released as, uh, as open source. Um, and then we have the fact of the standardization, which uh, sometimes uh, is said to play the, the opposite role in which standardization doesn't allow for innovation. Uh, however, we can also have the, the the role of open standards, and this is something that uh, I believe Europe should uh, focus on. So standards should be also open in order to foster this kind of innovation, and uh, hopefully ma mainly through open source. And I think that, for instance, in the case of of the cloud services uh, certification scheme, uh, this is uh, the way in which it's currently being done, in which uh, the standard will be, let's say, open and public for, for everyone. So that every company uh, can develop their own tools and, send their, and sell their own tools in order to comply with the certification scheme. Thank you. And Jesus? Yeah. I, I fully agree with Leire on the topic of open standards. So the way that I see it is that the open source should be an enabler uh, for standards in the sense that open source can help to create these reference implementations that uh, should provide or should facilitate adoption of standards. The problem that I see at the moment is that still we have just too many closed standards, which is I will not yet call it a showstopper, but at least on my experience, the usage of standards, even on specific communities, on more open communities, is always a better leveraged by the use of open source. So I, I remember my experience from many years ago when we were not talking about the cloud, but about grid computing. So we used to participate in the Open Grid Forum, the OGF, and there were several uh, success stories about the use of open standards with open source. At the moment, this is talking from my cybersecurity perspective, this is something that we don't see that often. Um, at least, yeah, um, or we see it, let, let me try to rephrase it, we see it happening more, for example, with NIST in America than in other regions. So Bosch as a global company, we have to observe the development of open standards and open source in, in yeah, worldwide. And we see at the moment uh, that uh, NIST in America, they are actually quite well positioning themselves in the development of both of these. So it's something that uh, I hope we can also further motivate in Europe and other regions, of course. Thank you, Rob. Well, first of all, I would like to say that um, most of the major public clouds are founded on open source software. So, I mean, AWS was built on Zen Hypervisor, which is open source. Um, they offer a lot of platform as a service solutions that are founded on open source, like RDS Postgres and RDS MySQL. Um, so open source has, has built the cloud. Um, I think the new developments that we are seeing are, well, I think after the COVID, uh, you know, rush on the cloud, um, the bills are sort of, the bills are finally coming in, you know, um, and people are kind of, you know, reassessing um, how much of the infrastructure they want to rent versus um, retain on premise. Um, with that said, um, I think that a lot of organizations are struggling with kind of the, you know, getting the same experience as the public cloud in, in their own environments. And again, it's open source that's leading the implementation of the, you know, the next generation of private clouds. Um, Thank you. Antonio? Thank you. Um, so I'm coming from standardization and I'm learning about open source. So, uh, but I really believe that the goal, the two go very well together. Of course, you can have different organizations, non-open source with standards, and standards and open source that are not based on standards. Okay, but uh, the combination is really win-win. Okay, uh, my view of open source is uh, you can use it for many uh, things that you want to share, generic, platform level, technology level, development tool level. Okay, but from standardization, uh, the the way I, I see how we structure standards is we start from the architecture of the system or the architecture of the entity of interest, because you can have the architecture even of a process, of an organization or things like that, okay? And then those organizations, those architectures are reflected as models, okay? 
And when you have the models, and I call them open models, preferably because when they are standardized, they are open models, then you can do an open source implementation. Okay. I'll give you an example of what we have been doing so far on privacy. We just started ISO IEC 27564. I'm reading my stuff and not, not, not my heart. Okay. It's called privacy models. Okay. And uh, the idea is to see whether we can express privacy solutions, privacy controls, privacy protection mechanisms uh, through models. Okay. And uh, those models, hopefully most of them are open. You can always have a closed model. Okay. But then when you have this, uh, the idea is to go for an implementation. And we are in parallel having an Eclipse. So sorry to mention Eclipse, but Eclipse, I think, is an open source organization. And uh, they have a, the, they provide the capability to provide a working group. So we are creating a working group called Privacy by Models uh, Working Group, where we will discuss how uh, we uh, do correctly the transition between open models for privacy to some solutions, okay? So I really think that uh, this is a win-win combination. And I hope that we will be able to demonstrate it in the example I just showed. Thank you. Alessandro? I'll try to be brief. I, in terms of the development, the, the, the near-term, uh, medium-term development of the European cloud, or in general, cloud computing all around the world too, I believe that there are a number of macroscopic forces that are really reshaping the direction that we're taking. At one level, for example, I believe that the things that have happened in the last few years with some big tech players like Facebook Meta, for example, are creating the conditions for a number of players in the industry and in the audience and the general audience a bigger demand for transparency and confidentiality. So I believe this will be two big elements of the shape of the way the cloud will look like. In transparency, of course, open source has a big role if it's used in the proper way. It's not automatically a one-to-one -one relationship, but, but certainly can help. In terms of confidentiality, there is a big role that um, open source is taking right now. So for example, when we talk about confidential computing, uh, my company, Red Hat, has been doing a lot of work with Intel and AMD. So there is a growing role um, for, for open source from that standpoint. And then the second rising angle that I think is becoming really important, and it will shape um, cloud computing going forward, that is the, the climate conscious angle, right? This desire to be more, more aware, more conscious in the way we utilize planet resources. And this, this is not just about the, the use of um, solar and, and wind power to decarbonize the data centers. I believe that it's also about how efficiently you use the data centers. So there is a growing conversation about, okay, what you used to do, I go a little bit more technical for a second, when you used to do just the deployment of virtual machines, uh, uh, now you just need to start increasing the density of the workload by having a number of big number of containers in the virtual machines. And where there are containers today, there is a, a, a growing uh, amount of organizations start contemplating the use of uh, what is called serverless functions and serverless computing. So this increase of density to use the data center resources uh, with climate in mind uh, and, and be more efficient in the use, I believe is going to really be important. And about these technologies, of course, open source is, is, is playing an enormous role. Containers are based on open source. Uh, we have Docker, we have Kubernetes, and all the other technologies that probably the general public is very well aware of. Thank you, Alessandro. And uh, we already have a question from, from the chat. Federico Facca is asking, he said that he's curious uh, about your view about why European large corporations are not contributing to open source as, for example, American ones, US ones. And now also Chinese companies are ramping up a lot of contribution. This, I think it's an interesting uh, point as uh, the European Commission is also very aware now that it's not enough to embrace open source by using it, but you also have to contribute and also lead sometimes. So uh, any takers for these questions?
I, I think there I is a pop. fair amount of contribution. Uh, Spotify, yeah. for example, um, Canonical mm -hmm. is a is a is a European company. Yeah. Um, SoundCloud, another. You know, there there are companies out there that are contributing quite extensively to open source, um, and laying the foundations for the future. You know, and they're European. You know. Um, not quite sure where that question Just to mention, uh, since uh, I, I I had the uh, open source 101 last year with my brother, who who, mm -hmm. who is working for Orange, and uh, he was in charge of ONAP, which was the biggest open source uh, stuff on uh, telecommunication, and uh, Orange is part of it. It's one of the leader. Okay, so it's European people, companies are also involved. Yeah, I, I have to talk from my perspective, and even though I cannot talk for the whole Bosch. So at least from my uh, cybersecurity perspective, open source, open standards, uh, my belief is that sometimes what is needed are the right tractor initiatives for this. Mm -hmm. So we contribute, and as mentioned by Leire, we work together on the Medina project where we have committed to the development of open source uh, as Bosch in our contributions. We are also working together and probably with uh, some other of the members of the audience on the Gaia X initiative which, correct me later if I say something wrong, is also devoted or based on open source. So I think it really depends. Again, I cannot talk for the, for the whole Bosch. It really depends on the area. So when we have this tractor initiative, this uh, flagship initiatives that are devoted to open source, you will see that the industry will also come to them. So just talking about Gaia X, the three major mm -hmm. cloud service providers, they are also there. So they commit somehow also to open source. And of course, from a European perspective. So I, I think depends on these factor initiatives. Yeah, please, Antonio. I can get back uh, because uh... Jesus mentioned Gaia X, and uh, so it's a very nice example of uh, maybe this uh, future possible win-win uh, combinations about open source and uh, uh, centralization. Okay, so uh, you know that uh, Gaia X uh, is this huge initiative. Uh, hopefully, it will work. Uh, something will work uh, to 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 have uh, this federated data space uh, for the cloud. Okay. But not only for the cloud, integrating everything. So this is uh, my stuff. It's for IoT. I'm coming from IoT. IoT is there, okay? So there are a few uh, research organizations such as uh, AIoTi and BDVA. One is focusing on uh, AI. The other one on uh, uh, IoT. So we work together, and we said, okay, uh, we need to understand how uh, whether we can integrate ourselves in the, this landscape. And we had discussion with uh, uh, Gaia X and things like that. And it works really fine. And actually, even they created a, 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 an alliance between Fireware, BDVA, uh, IDSA, and Gaia X, okay, to, to work on those things. So this is a thing under making. But in parallel, we decided to uh, develop the two position papers, one uh, focusing on the integration of IoT, the other one uh, focusing on metadata, which is, of course, an important part of uh, data space, okay? And every of those things needs standardization, okay? So uh, we are currently pushing uh, the creation of a family of standards at ISO. And actually, I'm currently in this in the session and we have already started. So uh, there are a few items of uh, standardization that are in the pipe. And we do it in a consistent way uh, so that uh, we are not just isolated, okay? And this is maybe uh, the comment from Federico Faka why US and China uh, are uh, so uh, leading is because they work, it's a big uh, unit that is lead working. And I hope that this time when we do it, it's not just French people doing their things, German people doing their things. We get together and we're mm -hmm. something stronger because we first have agreed and we have a big, uh, uh, same agenda, okay? And then we, pu we push that and this would be stronger. So I would say, yes, uh, maybe uh, in Europe, sometimes we're lagging but it's because uh, we are a bit fragmented and we need to take into account uh, the help that the commission can provide mm -hmm. to us that we get again united okay thank you and uh, just a uh, follow-up i see that federico also now wrote in the chat some data that among the top 10 contributors to OpenStack and kubernetes uh, we only uh, there are no uh, the only european company is ericsson so fair enough uh, and if you followed the, the opening session, there was also an invited talk um, by uh, Mark Dietrich from EGI, that is a partner of the HCloud project uh, where Federico coordinates. Uh, and they were also showing that uh, 
the European market for cloud is not so different than the, U- the, the US, but there is a higher fragment, so that there is no fragmentation on the infrastructure as a service layer. So this may be, as you, as you said, it depends on the subject, it depends on the, on the area, and then maybe Federico had in mind more this uh, building blocks of cloud infrastructure and Kubernetes, but in other areas like manufacturing, then we have, uh, we have a more distributed, let's say, um, European uh, contribution to open source. And I would like to also um, in seeing, uh, let's say, put into you know, to, to your attention another another topic that is very dominant these days, which is uh, let's say edge computing or conver- convergence cloud IoT or uh, cloud computing continuum. So this is uh, the general trend towards uh, more decentralization and uh, let's say. Um, much more context-aware uh, network architecture. So applications run on more multiple nodes uh, and uh, particularly on very heterogeneous nodes. Uh, so how do you see the, um, the interplay between uh, open source and open standards that on the one hand they strive for homogeneity and this need to deal with uh, such a host of very different uh, um, uh, situation, very different configuration from the hardware to the network, to the computing power, to the trust boundaries, you know, local data, all these topics have been have been discussed uh, also in the open in the open sessions of, of today. Uh, so do you see open source and open standards uh, helping or should they be kind of tempered uh, with with more diversity or um, what is your uh, your your take on that? So I don't know. <laughs> okay, maybe I can start uh, yeah. with uh, my view. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, the standards, because open source, I have a different view and maybe a weaker view. Okay, open sta- uh, concerning standards. Okay, um, the, first of all, the continuum is absolutely necessary. Okay, I give you an example uh, for privacy. You would rather prefer data to be kept close to the device. Okay. So when you have IoT Edge Cloud, if we just see this, uh, if the, the, the data is kept at the, at the, the, the device level, uh, it can bring lots of benefits, actually, not only for privacy, but also for IPR issues, OK? So we have that kind of thing. So uh, we need to have uh, distributed computing capabilities, which open source can help, OK? But uh, what is very important is to make sure that actually it's flowing freely, okay? And this is complica- complicated. I'm not saying this is solved. And hopefully there are research projects or new advance that will help us do that, okay? Uh, but we have solutions such as, uh, of course, the distributed agreement stuff, so that specific technologies to make sure that uh, these distributed computing can happen in a trustworthy manner. And of course, this can rely on open source. Now, the execution part, like, for instance, having a, a, a Java machine or whatever machine that runs everywhere, maybe that's a little bit harder, okay? But I, I'm pretty sure that uh, it, it, things can happen, okay? And I, 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 I would leave the floor to Red Hat. Maybe they're working on those things, okay? Well, let's continue. Okay, then, Alexander, if you have something, otherwise we go around. Since Antonio mentioned you explicitly, so what? Uh... So maybe I can just continue. One thing yeah. is that uh, um, when you have a, a, continu- a continuum, very likely, but uh, maybe not, uh, you have many organizations uh, in the pipe. Okay, so uh, organization operating, say, uh, or in charge of a vehicle or drone. Uh, you know, a sensor, it's not the same as what runs on the roadside unit uh, for edge computing and uh, in the cloud, okay? Not the same organizations, uh, it's completely different. So so we are trying to put all the people together, okay? Open source will help for that, okay? Mm-hmm. But one thing that is very important is interoperability and making sure that this interoperability is trustworthy. I'm exchanging to you. I know you, I authenticate you, and then uh, when we exchange, uh, we know that your behavior and my behavior are well understood and we can work together, okay? And this is why uh, in, at the enterprise level, we have what we call a facet. We have transport uh, uh, 
facets, syntactic facets, semantic facets, and we have behavioral and uh, policy facets, okay? And uh, actually, we just launched a, a standardization work item in SC41 on that. I will be one of the, I will, actually, I will be the main editor of that one. <laughs> I want to I want to pick up on what Antonio just said about the cloud mm -hmm. container. I believe that is even bigger than that. I absolutely agree with what he said, but I believe that this is going to be even bigger than this. Right now, we think about the cloud continuum in terms of what we see today, in terms of cloud existing centralized hyperscalers, in terms of edge computing and IoT. But this is really just the beginning. In the next few decades, we're going to see a Cambrian explosion of IoT devices that go under the umbrella of what is called today human body augmentation. So all the devices that will not just measure, they will try to fix and improve the health of citizens to the point that I constantly talk about the human body as the ultimate edge data center. Just yesterday, the Republic, two days ago, Elon Musk was talking uh, on the um, Wall Street Journal CEO conference about one of his companies, Neuralink, that develops uh, brain uh, machine interfaces. And he was telling like something along the lines of being ready next year, clearly very optimistic, that being ready next year to do uh, brain interfaces implants in human patients to cure uh, spinal cord injuries. So tetraplegic that can regain, and I'm quoting, full body functionality. Now, even if it's too optimistic, the point is that this kind of technologies are coming. So what we think today in terms of scale of the cloud continuum actually is just a tiny fraction of what is going to happen. And I believe that this is going to have an impact in, at the European level, but globally, because we will probably want to start thinking no more in terms of cloud computing, but in terms of planet computing. It really becomes, as Antonio say, a very sophisticated, very complicated, huge scale interplay between all these devices that cover the entire world and go into biological too. So this is this is one element. Clearly, for my my personal angle, the, the AI automation, cybersecurity, this way of thinking and this development uh, is going to have an enormous impact. I'll give you one example. The, the automation used to be, over the last few decades, considered and used as a very tactical tool. And all of a sudden now, because of what's happening today, what will happen more in, in, in the coming decades, according to what I just described, automation is seen more and more as a strategic tool that, that is the only way to face the scale, this complexity, the speed that the cloud continuum is delivering. Thank you. Uh, Leire, for example, you have something to, to add to this question, or I can move on to other topics or Jesus or Rob? No. Okay. Uh, well, I have yeah, a different please. perspective on it um, mm -hmm. that I'd like to, to table. Please. So I think in the past, you know, land ownership um, was a way of getting really rich and cementing power. So, you know, um, nobody got richer than the guy that owned the land, right? So if you were renting land from somebody, somebody was always going to get richer on your back, right? Um, in some ways, we're seeing this happening again with uh, the, uh, the the capital being put to use of the, the cloud, the cloud infrastructure, public cloud. Um, and um, it's just something to be aware of. So whilst it has a short lifespan, so hardware has it depreciates, right? So it, it the, the, the value proposition of the cloud is time limited. Um, there is a increasing control of the supply chain behind the hardware, right? So today you can get an edge, competitive edge, by buying a faster computer. Will that still be the case? You know, if if the the cloud becomes the de facto way to to procure uh, IT services, will, will you still be able to get that competitive edge um, without going to the cloud? Um, if the you know if the supply chain is controlled, um, which it kind of already is, um, by the major players, um, and you know the kind of the the fabs that manufacture the silicon um, behind those. Uh, systems are, are fully booked out servicing those major players, then it becomes a serious concern. I think where open source can help here is, well, for example, the RISC-V architecture um, is an open source chip architecture. Um, and in this case, um, you know, okay, it's a silicon architecture is not, not, not in itself an, an answer. You have to 
you know, you have to have your own implementation of it. Um, but this is certainly a way to kind of keep the door open for the future. And again, it's open source that's doing this. It's not proprietary solutions. Um, so that was my, my take on this. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a very interesting angle and it also resonates with some uh, points that were made by uh, European Commission representatives uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, digital autonomy and open source that is also was also the topic of, of this morning, where, uh, yes, open source software, but also more and more hardware or even co-design in some specific uh, domains that try to optimize the software and the hardware that run on for, for, for specific uh, uh, edge and, uh, and, um, and far edge situations. And uh, this topic of digital autonomy also, uh, let's say, um, connects to another point uh, that is uh, resilience, right? So even today, of course, the, the, the transformation in cloud adoption and usage uh, triggered by the pandemic has been, has been mentioned. We are here on, on an online platform, but this whole event was supposed to be, to be uh, um, held uh, physically. So we see that uh, the, uh, there is more and more uh, awareness that uh, it's uh, not just about optimizing for the best case, so to run business as usual, as fast as, as uh, let's say, uh, effectively as possible, but it's also about uh, coping with uh, unexpected factors. And again, at European level, there are quite a few initiatives that try to push this resilience uh, uh, point. And so I would like, again, uh, to ask you, uh, how do we kind of bake or how do we incorporate uh, a resilience readiness kind of thing in, in, in the standards and in the, in the free or free open implementations that we can have for, for the important infrastructure components in cloud? So how do we help with uh, resilience at the starting at the infrastructure component level? So maybe I can start again because um... At standardization, we talk about resilience, okay? So mm -hmm. TC292 is uh, security and resilience. So it's about uh, uh, the resilience related to security issues, okay? And uh, in, uh, so uh, in uh, SC27, we talk about cybersecurity, and there is a standard, which is actually under making, this 27, sorry for the numbers, first of all, 27035. Uh, resilience okay but it's resilience of security uh, it's not resilience in the sense of uh, the overall resilience of the cloud but it gives us some indication okay and uh, the indications are the following first of all we must be ready uh, to always check for vulnerabilities that's the first thing okay so and checking for vulnerabilities is again a joint work which is uh, very easily done if you go for open source because looking for vulnerabilities related to the open source you have the whole community to look at it, okay? And I know that the open source uh, implementation when it comes to security, cybersecurity, they have those kinds of schemes. They are probably very professional and very advanced already, okay? The reason is because they learn out of practice, okay? So we need to be prepared to learn about vulnerabilities out of practice. And then we have to prepare ourselves for the escalation of a vulnerability into some incidents, okay? So the incident is the... So a major stuff ongoing, and we have, of course, the catastrophes and things like that. And uh, the cloud or what we are doing could be part of it. And it could be escalated because it could be uh, earthquake, which creates a problem or the other way around. Okay, so things like that, okay? And then we have to be prepared. And uh, of course, uh, uh, so we need to create uh, working groups and uh, incident management teams and uh, have, uh, even have those called rescue teams and things like that. But this comes after. And my, my, my take is, first of all, uh, we need to agree that uh, we will have a work, an agreement, and I think there is, on uh, this vulnerability aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, one, one common, one, sorry, one, one more comment on Antonio's. Um, so um, one common criticism of cloud services is that the provisioning layer is proprietary and it's not open to scrutiny. So whilst we have like MITRE and the CVE tracking system for um, distributed code for open source and, and as a proprietary distributed code, we don't have a similar system for cloud services, platform as a service and software as a service, um, which 
it's kind of concerning for a from a kind of resilience uh, perspective. Um, it's not easily addressed either. But I would say that you know one way to address this is to open source the provisioning software. You know the op the the cloud provisioning systems. Um, if they're open source, then yep, that this is also a topic also on the lower layers of uh, of below operating system kernel and try to have also open alternatives for that. Can I mention an example? Sorry if I think. Well, I think there are okay. open alternatives. In yep. that's good. No, no. Go, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Sorry, so yeah. I, I just want to. So, Lire, you want to speak? Uh, sorry, I don't want to. Yeah, but... there was a lag, so I thought Lire wanted to speak, but then I. Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. I was saying that I think there are, or there, there are going to be alternatives. Let's say so. Um, we have, I think, uh, Open Nebula, maybe not in the same scale, but we have Open Nebula that is open source and it's focusing also on the whole uh, continuum, let's say, or trains on the whole continuum. Uh, and then we also have the example from o OVH uh, that they promised to release um, the way in which they deploy their software on the cloud, let's say. Uh, as open source, so I think we have there are some examples that could be um, leveraged uh, also in Europe, and then we also have, of course, uh, Gaia X and, and, and the different groups on the storage and on infrastructure that are working on on that respect. So I think we are in the right path, let's say, but we still need a lot of uh, work to do and a lot of commitment from the different companies. So, so just to uh, tap on what Leire said, okay, so uh, what is really true is uh, we have an issue that uh, organization can hesitate to uh, publish or not publish or make available, not available, okay, and sometimes for good reasons, okay, and uh, really going for open source is already meaning, I really think, that people have thought about what it is they put together, okay, and uh, so you have to have an architecture of transparency what it is you put together and what it is you want to keep for whatever reasons. And uh, uh, when it comes to resilience, you have to think about it because if you hide things that uh, prevent resilience management to take place, this is not good, okay? So we need to, to go into that direction. And to me, one of the main objectives when we design the system, the architecture, is that we have this architecture of openness, architecture of transparency, what it is we put together. And uh, if we have this, if we agree, everything is smooth, okay? Because we know the rule of the game, okay? So I just want to give you an example. There is a very nice movie, so I cannot, uh, I will find the, 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 the YouTube uh, in, in uh, Everson. It's, it's uh, led by the, the UK Digital Twin Hub, okay? And it's about the climate resilience demonstrator. It's called Credo, okay? And you see a movie where you have a problem, but basically, there's a lady that is responsible for this, uh, maybe the UK digital twin, climate uh, resilience digital twin stuff. And he, he's, she's in, as, uh, calling uh, the CEO of the company, uh, providing a, a grid stuff, and says, yeah, do you want to be part of our program? He said, well, we don't know. We have confidentiality issues. We cannot share our data and things like that. At the end, she, she said yes. And that's the, the good end of the story. Okay, So I tried to find the... The YouTube link and I, I based on the chat. Okay, thank you. If you can paste it in the chat, I think it might be might be an interesting uh, uh, anecdote. Um, we have a little more than five minutes. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, Jesus, that you haven't uh, mentioned anything. In is there anything that you think is particularly relevant from a cybersecurity point of view on this topic of resilience that hasn't been mentioned that you want to add, or we start? Yeah, yeah. Just from my side, and uh, I'm not so sure if the comment came from Leire or Antonio, it's about the topic of transparency. So resilience, now we have been talking from the perspective of the open source. So open source by nature, it targets more transparency from a technical perspective, but also for security and cyber resilience is important, the organizational perspective. If I have open source, but my organizational procedures are completely closed source and they are uh, not transparent to my custom to my customers 
then it really, we are not solving the problem. I think that we have to see the problem of resilience also in cybersecurity in a holistic way, targeting not only the technical parts, but also the organizational parts and making this transparent to the customers. And this is something that I like in particular from the um, uh, cyber, European Cybersecurity Act, the new set of certifications that are coming in this area to provide more transparency to the customers, which I think that uh, they will provide also a higher level of uh, resilience for the European infrastructures. Thank you. We have uh, four minutes. Uh, maybe I can give you a, like a TV show style, 30 second uh, uh, round. What do you think is the next uh, best thing that uh, we can get for the European cloud through the proper use of open source and standardization? What, what is that we need? So Alessandro. If you think, I don't know if I'm going to fit 30 seconds, but if you think about open source today, it is a really a, an enormous mechanism, a global scale, to converge towards a set of technologies that have been voted the best to solve a particular problem. Okay, so if I can, if I can quote um, Warren Buffett uh, when he talks about the the stock market, it's a voting machine in the short term. It's a waiting machine in the long term. That meaning that. Over time, open source remains healthy in terms of communities and contribution only for those systems that are designed in the right way. They are designed for simplicity and resilience and transparency and all the other topics that we touched today. So I believe that there is enormous opportunity for open source to keep fueling the, the, uh, the European cloud going forward. My concern is only that, historically speaking, open source community have been focused very much on the infrastructure level on the stack rather than the application level. There is less contribution. It's not that it's completely devoid of activity and even less on the operational framework. So my my call, if I use this 30 seconds, is for contributors uh, all around Europe to, to contribute more at different level of the stack and make more robust what is the open source project that can be used by the European community. Thank you. Antonio? So my conclusion would be uh for the benefit of open source, okay? Uh, my, my view is in the future, we have this uh, huge data space ecosystem where data is uh, uh, subject to lots of data operations. So we have the data life cycle, okay? But what we want uh, really, is if I'm looking for the trustworthiness point of view, security, but privacy, we want to have what we call full stack integrity. That is actually from provenance to, 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 to the, the, the grave, from, from the cradle to grave, okay, each data operation is uh, doing something, a data operation, according to uh, the defined usage, allowed usage, okay? How can you do this? So you have to split uh, your uh, processing into smaller operations. Each operation is software, okay? And the software could be done by an open source, uh, which actually you have scrutinized because he does it properly. And then you only allow those types of software to run okay so okay. you can have a mechanisms where end to end you ensure full stack integrity and open source to me is an incredible good solution to make it happen quickly okay thank you rob yeah the cloud is moving really really fast i mean it's an incredibly fast moving um uh environment um things are evolving extremely far you know like major events that took place over a decade um, take place in like months nowadays, uh, thanks to the cloud in, in part. Um, if Europe wants to build a, a cloud com computing solution that's uh, um, going to compete, then you're going to need to use open source. You have no other choice. Thank you. Jesus? Yeah. In the cloud and also with other technologies, so the topic security but obscurity is a big no-no anymore. We need to be more transparent also from a cybersecurity perspective. And for me, that means open source, but also it means open standards and, of course, open certifications which are derived from those standards. Very clear. Thank you very much, Jesus. And later, you can close. Yeah, so I would like to complement what Alessandro and what Rob said uh, with respect to the part of the yeah, open source and infrastructure, let's say. Uh, I think that the Commission is going to launch or has launched an initiative under the Digital European Pro Digital Europe uh, program related to smart middleware uh, 
for um, yeah federation of clouds let's call it that way uh, that is focusing on the on a lot of the aspects that we are talking today here uh, the solution should be deployed as open source so hopefully also everyone in, in Europe can also contribute to this smart middleware and it should also play with the rules let's say of Europe uh, with standards, uh, open standards, hopefully in most cases, uh, open certification, as Chris was mentioned, and of course with the highest levels of security, transparency, and, and so on. So I think that that's a good initiative, let's say also coming from the European Commission, that should be hopefully promoted further. Certainly. Thank you, Leir. And uh, we are now wrapping up. Uh, all is left for me is to thank you all once again, all the speakers and experts and uh, attendees uh, that uh, really contributed to the session. I would kindly ask the support to put back the slide uh, that announces the next session. That should be at three, if I'm not mistaken, so that I can uh, give a short heads up to the to the. Um, attendees, uh, this uh, next session is about uh, um, the success stories and use cases in European cloud computing and uh, will be moderated by uh, Monica Listi. But can you please, uh, if you have it, show the slide that was after the one that I have. So yes, I have it uh, signed at uh, 15 to 15. Okay, so I can just then name the, the, the five panelists. We, there will be Carla Arendt from IDC, Patrizio Dazzi from the Italian Research Center CNR, Konstantinos Zerpes from the University of Athens, Gert Martelinks from Threefold Tech, and Alberto Marti from Open Nebula. So thank you once again for following the session, and uh, I give you... Uh, all the best for the continuation of the event and see you soon at three in the session about use cases and success story from the European cloud community. Thank you very much.